folks. Don't miss heaven. Don't miss heaven. Don't miss heaven. Heaven is open to you. Why would you choose to go to hell? Why would you choose to live in deception? Why, why, why would you choose this? When the life of God can be yours. The redemption of God can be freely given to you. Why would you die in your sin? That's all the devil wants to do is get the fight out of you and kill it. So you won't labor in prayer anymore. You won't weep before God anymore. You can sit and watch television and your family go to hell. You see, those of us who preach the gospel, we are not here to entertain you. This is not a game. We are not here to talk to you about temporal things, about how you can get the best that you can get out of this present life. No, I am not concerned tonight about your self-esteem. I'm concerned about one thing. One day, each and every one of you will stand naked before a holy God and you will be judged. I think we comfortably distance ourselves from that reality. There are those who claim to be preachers who don't ever talk about hell, wouldn't talk about hell, avoid it at all costs, when the truth of the matter is it ought to be the first thing that we talk about when we talk about the gospel. This is about salvation from hell. This has to do with the Word of the living God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, life and death, heaven and hell and it is an amazing burden for a preacher to stand before a group of people knowing that some of you will hear my voice and go to heaven when you die and others of you will hear warning after warning after warning and you will not listen and you will die under the wrath of God and spend eternity in hell we have given account because we watch for your soul does it really matter to you that your unsaved loved ones are dying and we're getting closer and closer to the end? It, it, uh, does it really concern you? They could die and go to hell. And even if they hear that there is danger, even if they hear that there is such a thing as hell, just like the monkeys when they see the trappers coming, I mean, there's the danger right in their face. This guy's going to take me away. He, away. He's going to throw me in a place that I don't want to be. And even when the sinner sees, God is going to come for me. And He's going to throw me in a place I don't want to be. Even when they see the danger, they won't let go. Why won't they let go? That's the thing. Why will the sinner not let go? Because as we find in Hebrews, what is it? Hebrews 3.3? 3, 3, the deceitfulness of sin. But many, many people who profess to know Jesus Christ, even in our time, they, they create a garment of their own making that allows them to commit adultery. It allows them to steal in the workplace. It allows them to lie and gossip and slander unrestrainedly. And this garment that they put on themselves convinces them that there's no justice for this. There's no judgment day coming for them. Even though Jesus said, by every word you speak, you'll be justified, and by every word you'll be condemned. Jesus said, if you do not forgive those who have wronged you, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. But in spite of what God has spoken, they create a garment of fig leaves and they cover themselves and say, all is well, all is well. And they seek out a church that won't challenge their sin, that won't expose this hypocrisy for what it is. I'd rather you get mad at me and go to heaven. So many people today, I've been born again, they say. And you ask them, what do you mean by that? Well, I made my decision. I prayed that prayer. I asked Jesus to come into my heart. Yes, but has your heart changed? Has your life changed? Is it changing? Are you a new creature? Or someone who just repeated a creed and passed through a ritual? Can you honestly tell me that your great desire is not to be like the world? To not be like what you see here in the West and many other places, but to be like Jesus Christ. Can you tell me that? Because if you cannot, you should be afraid. I hear people say, well, I don't want to talk about hell. It's very negative. 
Jesus was a hellfire preacher. Verse 22 of chapter 5 of Matthew, I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be guilty before the court, and whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court, and whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you, it's better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Verse 30, if your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off, throw it from you. Better to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. You know what? 19 years ago, I had certain sins in my life I did not want to get rid of. And I knew, I knew God showed me, you are going to hell for those sins. And I knew I deserved it. And I saw it. And the danger stared me in the face. But there were certain sins I did not want to get rid of. And I'll tell you this, that very night on the 4th of July in 1990, when I opened my hand, bang, like that, I was saved. Because we're talking about rescue. Salvation is a word that means deliverance or rescue. And the question is, from what? You know, he, he desires to save you from hell, from the fiery hell. Jesus spoke more about hell than anybody else in the Bible. In fact, He spoke more about hell than everybody else in the Bible combined. He continually spoke about hell and He warned sinners to escape hell because of its horrible reality. There are people in this room right now who, if they die, will be translated into heaven and they will bear upon themselves a glory unspeakable. And there are other people in this room right now who, if they die, will be sent by the judgment of God straight into hell, where the grace of God is totally removed and they will be revealed as the monsters that they truly are. We have a great majority of the people in America claiming to be Christian and they live like devils. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Now here's what it means. That means I know that what I'm doing is wrong. I, I, I'm experiencing something that I know is wrong. I understand that what I'm doing is wrong, but I enjoy what I'm doing, even though it's wrong. It means to live two ways, one way in public and another way in private. We live in a world where sin is freely exploited, but we're very used to sinning, and we're very comfortable with sin, and consequently society has very few consequences that it places on people for sin. You've made peace with your sin. You've opened the door, you've invited it in, you've sat it down and you're feeding it and nurturing it and you're enjoying it and it gets to the point where you're able to call evil good and call good evil. A person who knows truth but lives in sin for a long time eventually will succumb to the, the fallen sin nature in us and eventually when you play with sin for too long, something gets into the mind, something gets into the spirit and wrong becomes right and somehow this twisted spiritual thinking comes into a person's mind where they're doing something abjectly wrong they once knew it was but now they believe it's righteous or somehow God understands it let me ask you a question do you look at the world and long to be like the world act like the world talk like the world dress like the world have the world's respect and the world's esteem if you're that way you ought to be terrified because that just could be evidence that God has not done a work in you. If God's power cannot be seen in your life, leading you to greater and greater holiness, then maybe there is no power of God in your life. That He has not regenerated your heart. You are not born again. You are not a Christian. You are storing up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. You're not getting away with anything. No act of fornication, no act of adultery, no sin in the mind, no sin in the behavior, no sin with the lips. 
no lie, no deception, no cheating. You're not going to get away with any of it. You're just accumulating iniquities, all of which will be confronted and judged. You are storing up wrath. That is a very difficult thing to convince people about who are so used to sinning. And at the same time, they're so used to getting away with it. They're not only used, can I say, to, to getting away with it in the culture and in the world, but professing Christians are used to getting away with it in the so-called church. This Christianity is, is not something that just should be a small part of your life. It is not something that you do on Sunday. Christianity is not about you living in the world six days a week and coming to church. Christianity is not about you being just like the world all the time and then coming to church on Sunday. If that is your Christianity, you have no Christianity. You are not Christian. Churches are, as so-called churches, are very, very reluctant to confront sin very reluctant to do the discipline that the Bible talks about doing to teach people the consequence of sin. We made a terrible mistake in America. We got tired of being laughed at. We got tired of being called holy rollers. We got tired of being mocked and we wanted to go uptown. We, don't want, we didn't want to live on the wrong side of the tracks anymore. We wanted to go uptown. We wanted to be called teacher, teacher, rabbi, rabbi. We wanted certificates on our wall. We wanted to be considered smart by a perishing society. In fact, what we wanted is the praise of men more than the praise of God. And so we got all our smart people now running on churches. And a whole country is going to hell in a handbasket. I'd rather be called a holy roller. I'd rather be laughed at. I'd rather be mocked and have the power of God upon my life. Praise be to God. This nation cannot be allowed to die in its sin when you and I are still here. We must call out now to the Holy Spirit. We must say, God, may I be considered a fool. I don't care anymore. As long as people find you as Lord and Savior, as long as they come, Please don't tell me, don't tell me you're concerned. Don't tell me that you want your unsaved loved ones saved when you're spending hours in front of internet or television. Let's just call sin, sin. Let's just call it the way it is. No more covering, no more phoniness, no more hypocrisy, no more appearance of godliness without genuine fruit in your life. No more of this phony religion. No more, no more of this fruit of deception. You know what, folks? When you really boil it down, you know why people won't repent? Because they don't believe. That's the issue. They don't really believe. You see, to believe a lie is to be an unbeliever. Why do you have all these crowd of people that are seeking to get in and they can't get in? I'll tell you why. Because they got the nut in hand. They'll come around and they'll say, I'm trying to be saved. I'm calling upon God to be saved. Let me see your hand. Yep, that's what I thought. You can't get their hand out because they got the nut in there. And they'll come around and they'll be in tears. And now, you know, I'm calling upon the Lord and He won't save me. And I'm doing this and I'm doing that and I'm coming to church and He won't save me. You know why? Got the nut in the hand. Monkey lets go of the nut. He's out right now. Uh, let me ask you is, is what I just said. Convicted you at all? Did you just let that go in one ear out the other? Folks, it's getting late and it's getting serious. We're on the very edge. We're either going to go with God or we're going to go into abject godlessness. It's not going to go both ways for much longer. There has to be a revival. There, there has to be prayer again. We've got to get in the scriptures and walk seriously with God. There has to be a testimony. It's because of God's house losing its focus in this nation that our colleges now have become hotbeds of radicalization even against this nation. God help us. God help us. Immorality is abounding. Our streets are turning into things that they ought not to be. You know, the Bible says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. And whatever a man sows, that's what he's going to reap. We can't 
pretend to be devoted to God in the house of God. When a church lowers the standard of the gospel in order to get more people to come in, when a church does not preach on holiness and what it means to be truly converted, then Christianity and the church fills up with a lot of ungodly people and because of their actions, the unbelieving world blasphemes the name of God. We are saved by faith alone. We are not saved by works. But what you need to understand is that a person who has been truly saved has been born again. They have become a new creature. God has done a tremendous work in them to demonstrate His power. He has made them into new creatures with new affections, new desires to serve Christ and to be holy. Has He done that to you? Now, you and I can, can sit at the borders of the land of promise and study and know it, but Paul says that don't deceive yourself. If, if you live in these things and are not moving away from them, I'm, I'm not saying that people don't struggle with this. Don't misunderstand me. But the child of God is not willing to make peace with sin. The true child of God moves away from it and begins to say, Lord, you said that if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things are passed away and all things have become new. So therefore, I'm not making peace with this. I'm not going to live this way. I'm not going to deceive myself. I'm getting up and I'm walking out of here by the power of Christ within me. I want to be set aside for you. I want to live righteously. I want to be a man or woman of God who makes a difference in my generation. I want your glory to come into my home and touch my children, my grandchildren, and my nieces and nephews, and my brothers and my sisters. I want your glory in my house. I'm tired of mediocrity. I'm tired of, of talking about something I should be walking. I'm tired about reading in history what you did through somebody else at some other time. And just like the people at that border, they had to be considering this one more time and saying, God Almighty, if it cost me my life, then let it cost me my life. But I'm going to go in and I want what is mine. Make a decision. I'm not living like this anymore. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not walking like this anymore. I'm not cowering under this anymore young person, listen to me. The things that are presented to you in this culture are more deadly than venom. The sensuality, the lack of discretion, the lack of decency, the rebellion, the love for money and vice and sex and all the things that this culture throws at you. It will kill you. The way this culture acts, the way this culture talks, the way this culture dresses. Everything about it is wrong. Don't do this. And folks, listen to me with churches on every corner. In this nation, there is no excuse for our society being the way it is today. If the glory of God was in the house of God, if the Bible was being preached the way it's written, if the real Jesus was being proclaimed to the people, if our focus was on prayer, if our focus was on the salvation of the nation, if our focus was on reaching the lost at any cost, I dare say this nation would not be in the condition it's in today. And I see people that are so far back in their understanding of God, so weak. And I find myself in the place where Ezekiel was. Can these bones live? Can they live? Can they, can they get beyond just being a historical testimony? Can they, can they get to a place where they make a difference in this generation? Can the weak still be made strong? Can the dead still live? Can those who are behind doors of captivity still get free? Can the giftings of the Holy Spirit still be given? Can we still become a voice and a testimony in the nation? Oh God, for their sakes, come to them and visit them again. Visit this vine, oh God, that has been produced in the earth by your hand. 
Lift us, O oh Jesus Christ, out of the dust and cause us to live again. Give us grace to become what you have destined us to be and give us strength, O oh God, to resist the gates of hell because you've told us that hell could not hold its captives when your church is moving forward. I'm just tired of being dry around some altar somewhere. I want life. I want the life that God has for me. I want the purpose that God has for me. Why is repentance and faith so hard? Why is there so much violence involved? Why are there so many people seeking to enter in who won't be able to? Why? Is the door into heaven, the kingdom of God, is it narrow? Yeah, it's narrow. It's very narrow. But I'll tell you this. It is wide enough and broad enough and open enough for every single person who desires to go through it, to go through it. But if there's, if there's even one thing in your life that you're not willing to get rid of, one idol in your life you won't give up, you can't go through. Idols and sin are too big to go through that door. For too many years, we relegated evangelism to a program because God was hardly doing anything in the lives of the people. But when God is at work, you don't need a pamphlet or a program as wonderful as that might be. You can't help but tell people, I've got to tell you what God has done for me and what He's done for me can do for you. It starts with us. It starts if we're going to be a blessing to the world. It starts in the church of Jesus Christ. It starts with the people of God. It starts with somebody somewhere that just says, I believe God. I believe the word of God. And for the glory of God and for the souls of men, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go into this battle and believe that Jesus Christ is going to be glorified. I believe that he breaks the power of tormenting thought that the devil has planted in people's minds. I believe that he erases the imprints of all of the evil of this world that has tried to gravitate and hold on to people's spirits. I believe he gives hope where there is no hope. He gives strength where there is no strength. He gives ability where there is no ability. I believe it with all my heart. And for a season and a moment, give every man, woman, and child an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I believe he can touch our generation again. I believe he can give courage to the members of government in the Senate and Congress who are Christians to finally stand up and declare who they are in Christ. I believe the Salvation Army churches can be filled again with the presence of God and with people seeking Him and Methodists, Lutherans, Baptists, even the Catholic Church, God can fill. And I stand and stake my life on it. I give my life to this city and to this cause of God in our generation. I believe it with everything in me. Enough apologizing, enough shying away, enough cowering, enough trying to explain away the power of God. I believe that every Jericho in my life must come down when Jesus is at the center of my heart. I don't care how thick the walls are. I don't care how long it's been there. I don't care how much it mocks God. If I'm willing to trust God to hold my peace and let him fight my battle, every power of hell is going to come down. The time of sitting and reflecting is over. The time for action has come. The time to stop studying about who is your neighbor and the time to go to your neighbor has come. You and I have got to believe that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That what he has done, he will do. And who he is, he will always be. The mercy of the Lord endures forever. His kindness is beyond your understanding and beyond mine. You know, many preachers don't go in to the life that Christ offers because they portray God as an angry God when in his heart he desires to be merciful. There is a day of justice and retribution and judgment coming rightly deserved by all of humanity. But till that day, God remains a merciful God. He's allowed God to go down deep in the soul and say, oh God, I can't do this on my own, but I'm not gonna let my kids go to hell. I'm not gonna let my husband, my wife. Oh God, 
I'm not going to live in this death. I'm not going to live in this lukewarmness and this coldness anymore. God, change me. And folks, I've been around the world again and listening to the cry of pastors, dead and empty, some treating their wives like animals. And here I haven't prayed in months. I haven't prayed in six months. And I know that sermons won't do it. I know that a new revelation won't do it. Covenant won't do it. I know now. Oh my God, do I know it. Until I'm in agony. Until I have been anguished over it. I'm preaching sermons. Oh God, I'm preaching sermons. Then I said, no, it's too late. I don't have that much time. And all our projects, all our ministries, everything we do, where are the Sunday school teachers that weep over kids they know are not hearing and they're going to hell? There's going to be no renewal, no revival, no awakening until we're willing to let him once again break us. It's very, very dangerous to play games with God, folks. Very dangerous. He's holy. He's righteous. He's a God of mercy, but he's a God of judgment as well. Very, very dangerous. No more dangerous game in the universe you can play than to play games with the holy God. I've had people sitting in this very sanctuary in adultery, lifting their voices and praising God. Side by side, adulterers. If you're a thief, the scripture says all thieves dwell outside of the city of God. Read it in Revelation. If you're a liar, you're not going there either. Sew whatever kind of robe you want, you're not going. You can get through the deception your whole life. You can even sing in the choir. <clears throat> you can go your whole life, but there's one moment you will not get through, and it's the last five seconds of your life, folks. You'll not make it through. Even if you have to bury your theology, sir, just bury it so I can get right with God. It's turn from your sin, for all this society is about to come under the justice of God.